It's good to see everybody here this morning. It is a great day. It's a beautiful day outside. It's a beautiful day in here. Uh, thank you for your attendance. It's just good to be together. Uh, reminders to everybody, please silence your cell phones if you have not done so yet, or at least put them on vibrate. Uh, we have communion in the back. We're not passing plates anymore, so if you have not picked up communion, you want to do that outside the doors, and then the contribution boxes are still located in the back as well. If you're visiting with us, uh, it's an honor to have you here. We ask that you fill out an attendance card in the back of the pew in front of you so we can have a record of your attendance, uh, stay around, talk to people afterwards so we can get to know you a little bit better. Uh, we have a nursery behind these windows. If you have need of that, please make use of it. And um, no children's church, correct? No children's church because we're set up for Bible school. And speaking of Bible school, Bible school starts tonight. Bible school starts tonight at 6.30. There will be no evening service tonight at 6. Our evening service will take place during the adult Bible class uh, during, well, during Bible school. So keep that in mind. Please be back at 6.30 this evening. And um, the elders have been trying to put together our life groups once again. Uh, we passed out sheets last week. Since then, we have made a few corrections, minor adjustments. There are new sheets back there on the table. Uh, pick up one of those on your way out. If you see any errors or omissions, please let us know so that we can get everybody into a group. And our group activities will begin in August. All right, that's all I have. Let's begin our worship together. Would you stand for the first song, please? First hymn this morning, number 250, How Sweet, How Heavenly. <clears throat> we'll have a couple extra, one extra song this morning, by the way. This, these songs kind of correspond with our Vacation Bible School lessons. <clears throat> how sweet, how heavenly is the song when Next hymn this morning, number 37, hymn number 37, Angry Words. <clears throat> Angry words, so oh, let them never from the tongue unbridled slip. May the hearts best 
Next hymn this morning, number 392, 392, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me and in you. We'll sing verse 1 and verse 3, <clears throat> and then after that our prayer will be led by Nathan Payne, scripture and prayer, verse 1 and verse 3. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me, for his wonderful passion and purity. Balfi, please. Our Father God in heaven, we're so thankful to, to gather around with people from different walks of life, all coming together with one heart and with one mind, with one goal in mind, and that is to worship your high and holy name. We're thankful for this opportunity that we have in this country to be able to gather freely without fear of persecution or imprisonment. We know that this is not a not the norm throughout the world, and we ask that you help us to be bold in our faith, to spread God's word, to help spread the hope that is in you throughout uh, all of this community, throughout all of the world. We ask that you uh, be with those that have been mentioned uh, in classes and previously that are suffering through various illnesses. Uh, many of us know one's suffering with cancer or with other illnesses and suffering 
uh, grief and uh, loss as well. We ask that you comfort them, be with those who are looking after them, taking care of them, uh, helping to restore them back to health. We ask that you be with um, the doctors and nurses and all those who are working to uh, help heal their bodies. But we know, Lord, that you are the great physician, the great healer, and that we put our faith and trust not in the doctor's hands, but in your hands uh, to, to move them in such a way to, to help benefit their bodies. Lord, we ask also that in, in this community and in this country that you be with the, the first responders, the, the police, the fire, the, the EMS service workers, all those who put their, her, their lives uh, on the line for the community that they may serve and protect, and we ask that you keep them safe uh, in all that they do. We ask that you be with the, uh, the men and women in the uh, military who are promoting the ideals of freedom that we love so much uh, throughout this world, and we ask that you keep them safe and you bring them home to their families as soon as possible. Lord, we know that nothing that we would say or do here today would, would be possible without your son and the sacrifice that he was willing to make to come to this world to live a perfect life and to die a, a criminal's death, a death that we each deserve for the sins that we've committed, but he took on that burden of sin for us and paid that price that we could never pay for, for ourselves. We're so thankful that he loved us and he considered us friends worthy, to, worthy enough to lay down his life for us. Because as we, as we continue this service, we help us to be mindful of that sacrifice as we gather around the table. Help Chris, Lord, to remember the things that he has he studied and prepared for us. And may the, the lesson that he presents be um, clear and concise. And, and something might be said, Lord, that might uh, touch the heart of one who has not put you on in baptism, has not named you as their Lord and Savior, and so that they may do so this day before it's everlastingly too late. Go with us throughout this day and forgive us when we go wrong. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Scripture reading for this morning. We'll be taken from the book of Ephesians. Uh, I'll be reading from the third chapter, verses 20 through 21. Ephesians 3, verses 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Next hymn this morning, number 916, Come Share the Lord, 916.
I want to talk to you about uh, a few dates this morning, and I want you to think about what comes to your mind when I mention a date for you. So September 11th of 2001, immediately, if you're 30 years or older, you remember where you were on that day and what happened on that day. We know that that's the date of the Twin Towers were or destroyed by terrorists who were, were had hijacked planes and, and uh, crashed into our towers and crashed into the Pentagon and the brave men and women that stopped the hijackers that crashed in Pennsylvania. I, I was in the 11th grade when that happened. I was sitting in my English class and they grabbed us all and they brought us to the history teacher's class and we watched it on TV. Uh, I, I wasn't there in New York or in Washington or in Pennsylvania, but I, was, I saw, at least recorded, what happened. My, my children have, don't have that same impact that I have. They, they know what happened on 9-11, but they didn't feel that same impact that I would have felt and how much more someone would have felt if they were directly impacted by it, if they lost someone that they, they loved or, or knew someone that was, that was involved in some way. They would even have a stronger memory than I do. I could throw out some more dates for you. Um, August 14th, 2004. Anybody here recognize that date? I hope at least one other person in here does. That was the day that I got married. And it was, I hope that's right, but it was a very important day to me when I made my vow to my wife in front of God and in front of everybody that was there that we were joined together. You know, uh, July 16th, 2019, my children were born, my twins, and then on April 9th, uh, my youngest son was born. So I remember those dates because I was there, and it was impressionable to me. I was not there in the upper room when Jesus met with his disciples. And if you will turn with me to the book of Matthew, in chapter 26, and just a few verses before Jesus delivers the, the Lord's Supper talk to the disciples, something important happens. In verse 14, we learn that then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of coins, of silver coins, and then Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And then just a few verses later, in verse 20, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table um, with the twelve. And while they were eating, I said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. And they were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely not I, Lord. And Jesus basically in verses 13 and verses 15 he tells Judas and confirms that Judas is going to be the one to betray him. So right after one of his closest 12 people that he's spent so much time with has, has gone to betray Jesus, Jesus tells the disciples what he wants to be remembered for. All of us have something that we want to be remembered for. 
I want to be remembered as being a good husband. I want to be remembered as being a good father. I want to be remembered as being a, a good Christian. But Jesus tells us in, in Matthew 26, um, verse 17, or 27 through 29, when he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out to you for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it in the kingdom. And in verse 26, it says, While well, they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. So we pick up in Matthew where Jesus did the, the Lord's Supper. And if we turn over to 1 Corinthians, Paul adds something in that Matthew didn't, didn't include. So in, in Paul's account, we find out in verses 23 through 25 of Corinthians chapter 11 that for I received the Lord also passed this on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So we pick up and we move to Acts chapter 2 and, and the church is being established and we move on into Acts and the church when they established themselves they, they knew what Paul had said to the Corinthians they knew that they wanted to remember what Jesus did because I was not there in the upper room I was not there when on Good Friday when the the when Jesus died, darkness fell on the land. I was not there to see the temple uh, uh, curtain ripped in two. I, I didn't get to experience that in person. So the impact on me would not be as great as someone who saw that. But Jesus knew that we as Christians were going to suffer for his behalf. And he knew that it was important that we meet together weekly and we we take the lord's supper our communion so that we remember that jesus hung on the cross and broke his body and shed his blood for the remission of our sins so as i read previously when jesus was in the upper room he he took the bread and he broke it and he said this is my body that is broken for you. Take and eat. Father God, I thank you so much for Jesus and for his body that he willingly gave to be, to be given for me. That he bore my punishment and then after after dinner Jesus raised the cup and he said this represents my blood that was shed for the remission of your sins and take and drink Lord, thank you so much for your son Jesus shedding his blood on the cross to pay my debt, to shed his blood for the remission of my sin, that I might have hope in him. Thank you, Lord.
This time I'd also like to uh, take the time to bless our contribution uh, for the work of the church. We have our contribution boxes that are in the back. As you, as you walk out of service this morning, please remember to, to drop those off as, you, as you're on your way out. Father God, I ask that you bless our gift, our contribution that we give today, to, that it might be able to do the work that you've called us to do as a church, to fund our ministries, to give to missionaries, to, to make sure that we are, we are doing the work that you've called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all please stand again. We'll sing hymn number 664. There stands a rock. 664. There stands a rock whose doors are high that raised to heaven is heaven's eyes. That rock is glad and ready for blood to find within this glad Invitation hymn this morning, number 255, I Am Resolved, number 255, Brother Chris. Good morning. It's good to see each one of you with us this morning. We're grateful to be back. At, uh, we are just returning from our mission trip to Scotland. Thirteen of us uh, got to go to Scotland this week uh, for a mission trip, and uh, it was amazing, and you shall go next time. Uh, we do something like that. It is fantastic. We would love to have every one of you. I think something special is going on here this week, though, isn't it? I think we're doing VBS this week, and we are excited about that. And you see some of the decorations on the stage behind me and throughout the building. So that will be an amazing time. Uh, make sure you invite all of your friends, uh, especially your, uh, your friends with young families, uh, and they will enjoy that and hopefully uh, will be built up by that effort there. So. One person can make an incredible difference, can't they? One person can make a big difference. Grab your Bibles, turn over to Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. When you think about uh, basketball, you think of a guy who made a big difference. You think of probably Michael Jordan, maybe, if you're from a certain era. Uh, maybe Kobe or LeBron, if you're from a different uh, some, some, several other ones made a huge difference, but I think we could all agree basketball would not be what it is today without Michael Jordan's influence. If you take out uh, the thing in your pocket, if, you, if it's got a big apple on the back of it, Steve Jobs made a pretty big impact in industry, didn't he? 
Apple, the company, would not be what it is today without this one guy's influence. If the name Marie Curie rings any bells, it's because you don't have fingertips that glow. She figured out that radiation is bad for us and that you should not put it on uh, your body in any way. So one person once again has made a large impact. Another guy that made a big impact is named Alexander Fleming. Uh, he is a Scot, actually. Uh, this is the lesson I, I presented in Scotland. and I was looking for something that would really connect with them. And one of the locals there told me, well, you remember Alexander Fleming, of course. I thought, ah, the name sounds familiar. If the name sounds familiar to you, it's because this is the guy that found out that penicillin is useful for us. So once again, a man has made, an individual has made an incredible impact. God uses individuals to make big impacts, doesn't he? Look in Joshua chapter 7. If you're familiar with the background there, what's just going on, uh, you know, of course, that the walls of Jericho have already come tumbling down. Maybe we'll sing that song this week. Um, but the walls of Jericho, Jericho's been defeated, hasn't it? God has done this thing. Uh, the Israelites have marched around Jericho's walls one time every day for seven days. On the seventh day, they marched around it seven times. They great, gave a great big shout, and the walls came down, didn't they? Because of what God has done. This doesn't have anything to do with what Israel did. They obeyed, and so they got the promise that God gave them of the walls coming down, of Jericho being defeated. But this is God's power at work here. And so... Everything in Jerusalem, or excuse me, everything in Jericho, God has said is devoted to destruction. These are all His things. Everything you find in there will be a sacrifice to Him. You don't take anything. Everything should be destroyed. It's a sacrifice to, to Yahweh. And so everything goes to plan. The Israelites walk around the walls. One time, every day, for seven days. On the seventh day, they walk around their wall seven times. They give a great big shout. The walls come tumbling down. The Israelites go into Jericho. They destroy everything. Everyone is killed. It's save Rahab and her family, who has made a covenant with Yahweh. And she will become an ancestor of Jesus as she is assimilated into Israel. Uh, so everyone outside of her family is killed. All the things are destroyed. Nothing is left alive or... Um, intact all, all the the money all the coats all the all the cattle everything is destroyed it's all the sacrifice for God and so Israel has won this incredible victory um, Jericho is the fortress city that enters into the Canaan's land and so Jericho is an impressive city the walls that they would have marched around were actually, there were actually two walls. There was an outer wall that was about 20, 25, excuse me, it was about 40 feet tall, several feet thick. And then if you were able to cross that wall or able to knock that wall down, you had to cross 20 feet of killing ground because the Jericho army was standing on a second wall and they were shooting arrows and throwing rocks and throwing spears at you. And there's just nowhere to hide in between these two walls. And so Jericho is unassailable, but God has assailed it and has overcome Jericho's mighty fortifications. After all of that is said and done, the Israelites look to their next conquest. It's a tiny little city. Uh, it's called Ai, right? I'm told uh, if you go back and look at the Hebrew, it's Ai, which is the Scots are very fond of because Ai, right? Uh, instead of yes, it's Ai. So, you know. The name of this city is Ai, is how we pronounce it. It's, just, it's a nothing city. Um, the, the people there are not warriors. For their defense, they would uh, run to Jericho. They depended on Jericho for their defenses. They live very close, just a couple miles away. And so Jericho was their, their fortress city. If, if someone attacked, they would go to Jericho, and Jericho would take care of the fortifications there and the defense there. And so the Israelites look at, forward to their next conquest in Ai, they say, let's not send the entire army up. It's just a small city, so let's just send three or 4,000 men over to this, this tiny city. We'll conquer it just like we conquered uh, Jericho, and things will be done. Do you know how the story ends? It's not how the story goes, is it? 
something happens. They send those 4,000 soldiers over to Ai and the farmers win the day. These guys don't come out with swords and shields and spears. They come out most likely with pitchforks, right? These guys are not warriors, but they will rout the Israelite army. Do you know why? Right? Joshua chapter 7 is why. Look what he says uh, in verses 19 through 21. Joshua chapter 7, verses 19 through 21. This is why Israel lost the battle against the tiny city of Ai. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan said, answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak of Shinar and 20, 200, excuse me, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and I took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sends some warriors over to the tent and everything is exactly as Achan has said it would be. And so Israel is routed here at the tiny city of Ai. But they conquered the incredible fortress city of Jericho. Why? One man's disloyalty to God made a big difference, didn't it? One guy's disloyalty to God made a big difference. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Let's start in verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. Listen to this part. This last part is where it gets golden. By every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What's Paul trying to say there? When every member of the local church is doing our job, when every member of the local church is on fire, passionately following God, what happens? The church is able to build itself up in love. When one person is not working hard for the Lord, when one person is not passionately following the Lord, what happens to the local church? We struggle, don't we? I don't have a clicker up here. Can you guys advance the slides? Get to the one with uh, our family trips. Yep, one more. There it is. We love hiking. Uh, you guys, a lot of you guys know that we like traveling and stuff. And uh, you see some pictures on the screen behind me on the, the, the my left, your right, uh, is our trip to the Arch. Um, that was really neat. Um, and we got some, some pictures here from our, our last trip up into Maine where we uh, we got to see the top of the world. It's incredibly windy there. It's very neat. You can see all the things. Uh, on the top picture is uh, we took a little hike, and it was the craziest hike I think I've ever been on. We were sliding down rocks, and it was way more hike than I had envisioned with uh, a two-year-old and five-year-old and, and me, a 39-year-old. <laughs> and then the, the bottom picture is uh, of Ethan and me several years ago. Not several because he's only two, but I guess last year, two years ago. Um, they got tired, right? You guys that hike and walk around with kids know they get tired very easily. And so they, they would look up at you and say, hold me, hold me. And so we would put them in these backpacks. That's great, right? I love being close to them. I like carrying them. I like them needing me. I, all those things are, are great. And I love the time we've spent hiking. And, and all those things are really special to me. And some of the greatest memories um, I hope they have when they're grown is is pictured in the, the scenes behind me. They're some of my favorite memories. This will not work when they're 25, though, will it? 
I can't carry them when they're 25 because they should have matured beyond that point, right? They won't need me to carry them by that point. Some of us have become stagnant and we're forcing those around us in the church to carry us because we haven't grown up yet. It's, it's time to mature for some of us. We need to mature and move on uh, to deeper things because if someone's having to carry us, what's happening? We're dragging the church down, aren't we? We're making the whole body struggle because each one is not doing our part. We're not all working passionately for the Lord. We're being, we're being carried. That's okay when you're little, right? When you're a young Christian, that's, that's fine. We should and would love to carry you when you're a young Christian. But as you mature, you grow out of this and you begin to be the one carrying other people's burdens, right? That's the negative side. Flip over one more slide for me, guys. Let's talk about some of the positive sides here. Some of these things that God has done through individuals. Because he doesn't do math like we do math, does he? Uh, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 17, you find a story that you most likely know well. Uh, this little boy has come to hear Jesus speak, we assume. Um, but along with him have come 5,000 other people. And they've been following Jesus for quite some time now. So long, in fact, that they don't have any food and they're about to faint from, from lack of food. And so Jesus looks around at his disciples and he says, you guys give them some food. And just kind of put yourself in the disciples' shoes for a minute. You kind of look around and there's not a town anywhere nearby. Jesus has been forced out into the wilderness at, by this point because he has attracted such a following he cannot set foot in a city. The cities are too small. He has a 5,000 man army following him. He can't set foot in any of the cities. Too, too small. Too big of a crowd. And so what do you do? Well, if you're Peter and Jesus looks at you and says, well, you give them something to eat. And Peter kind of looks in his pockets and he's like, I got nothing. And, and even if he did have enough money in his wallet to be able to feed 5,000 men even if they could somehow find enough uh, money to feed 5,000 men among the 12 disciples, there's nowhere to buy it. There's not like a city. There's not a restaurant close by. There's nothing nearby that can sustain this group of people. And all of a sudden, this little boy comes up. Now, this is an interesting bit of the story because the little boy didn't do it of his own. The disciples had enough faith to go out into this 5,000 uh, man crowd and start looking for for something. That says something about their faith, doesn't it? It says something about their faith that they knew that this was impossible, but what? They went and did it anyhow. They went and looked. Jesus does incredible things on the daily basis. And so why should this be any different? Let's go do our part and let's see what's possible because he seems to think anything's possible. So uh, I'm with them, you know, and that's kind of how I see Peter and James and John and the rest of the disciples here in this midst because they go out into the crowd. But one of them comes back with this little boy. He's probably Titus's age, maybe Abby, maybe Hannah. I don't know how old he is. He's, he's young, five or ten. And he, he comes up and he says, I got my brown bag lunch with me. And he kind of gives it to Jesus. Again, some pretty impressive faith right here. So Here's this little boy. He's got five loaves of fish in this thing, right? And he's got two, five loaves of bread. Did I say five loaves of fish? I'm tired still. So he's got five loaves of bread. And he's got two fish. And they aren't like catfish. We had uh, fish and chips while we were in Scotland. The fish was like the size of your head, and it was so tasty. But these things are not like that. These are small fish, sardine-like fish that you find in the Sea of Galilee. And so... He's got five loaves, and they're small, maybe the size of your hand, maybe smaller. Uh, so he's got five of those, and he's got these two little fish, and he brings them to Jesus, and he says, here you go. Jesus has a sense of humor. I don't know how all this worked out, but I wonder if he looked out at the crowd and looked back to the little boy's lunch and was like, okay. And what the little boy's reaction would have been, just as you walk through that scenario in your head. How are five loaves and two little fish going to feed this entire army of people, but you know how the story ends? It does. And there are 12 baskets of leftovers. 
Why are there 12 baskets of leftovers? Why do the apostles have to go gather up 12 baskets of leftovers? Have you ever thought about that? I'm always intrigued by the, 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 the specifics, in, especially in the Gospels and the narrative portions of Scripture. When he includes a specific, he concludes it for a reason. So what's the reason? Why does he include for us that there are 12 baskets of bread left over that the apostles gather up? I think each one of them gathers up a basket. One of them brought a little boy's lunch to Jesus in his hand, thinking, I don't know what you're going to do, but this is going to be amazing or it's going to fall flat on its face, but let's see. But by the time Jesus is done, each one of them brings up a whole, and we're not talking about a little basket like a picnic lunch. You're, you think a big basket that you, you would struggle to carry. These are large baskets. Each one of these holds a ton of bread, and each apostle's holding this massive basket, it would take two hands to hold. He's holding, each apostle's holding this one basket. One little boy made a huge difference, didn't he? Do you know Joash's story? Speaking of people who make huge differences, do you, do you know Joash's story? Joash leads an interesting life. He has at least one son, most likely has several boys, but his youngest one, has been called to do this incredible thing, this thing that nobody in his city is going to like. In fact, they're all going to hate him for this action, but he's been called to do it, and so he's going to do it. His son's name is Gideon. You know his story now. Joash is his dad, and Joash has a prized bull uh, in his fields, uh, one that is uh, seven years old, I believe, and it's been... He's been saving it, I guess, for a special occasion. And Gideon thinks that this is the special occasion that Joash has been waiting on. And so he goes into the town center and he cuts down the idol made of wood um, that his father has put in the city center. And he does it at night. And in the morning, everyone wakes up and they see what's happened. And Joash's uh, prized bull has been sacrificed using the wood from the altar that Gideon tore down. And they come in, and here's the dead bull, here's the, the burnt offering, and their idol is gone. And looks like it's been used as firewood, and the town is enraged, right? But you know how the story ends, of course. Gideon becomes God's champion throughout the next several decades. One man made a huge difference didn't he? God likes using individuals to bring about huge change. He can do it through you as well. Turn back over to 1 Samuel chapter 14. 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6. Fast forward in time past Gideon's day. Uh, to finally the united monarchy. It's united under one man, King Saul, the first king of Israel. He has a son named Jonathan. Jonathan is a mighty man of God. Uh, he has more faith than his father does and is righteous. He trusts in the Lord. And so during Saul's day, the Philistines will occupy Israel. Throughout Saul's reign, the Philistines will occupy Israel. And on this one occasion... Jonathan looks across and he sees a Philistine garrison. There's a Philistine army there. And he looks back at his friend. He's alone. These two men are alone. They don't have an army behind them. But Jonathan has this dream, this vision for what's about to happen. He and his armor bearer, the only two around, he looks back at his armor bearer and he says, let's go attack the Philistines. This seems like an incredibly bad idea if you're doing math the way that we do math, right? God doesn't do math like we do math. And so when Gideon started finding his army, do you remember how many he started with? He started off with 30,000, right? Do you remember what God said? Too many, Gideon. You've got too many people to conquer this Midianite force. 
Gideon's got to be scratching his head because he looks out at the Midianite force and he says, I can't even conquer this many people. I can't even count this many people, much less conquer them. And you say I've got 30,000 too many? And so what's God do? Do you remember? He starts whittling down Gideon's army. We'll get back to Jonathan in just a second. You need to hear this part too. So God says, Gideon, you're 30,000. They're too many. And so he starts whittling down his, his 30,000. He says, if you're afraid, you go home. Gideon's got to be thinking, this is the worst idea possible. If you're afraid, go home. 22,000 leave. So he's left with around 10,000 soldiers. Now he's like, okay, what, what now, God? And is this, is this sufficient? And God says, no, 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 you've still got too many. Too many? What do you mean too many? I don't have enough. You can't even count the Midianites. They're like the stars in the sky, the sands on the sea. There's innumerable amounts of them. What will I do? <coughs> God says, well, what you're going to do is you're going to whittle down your army even farther. You're going to whittle it down to 300 men. And so that's how it works out. Gideon attacks the Midian army with 300 men. But they don't carry swords and spears, do they? Do you remember what they carry? Torches and clay jars. This is the worst army ever. <laughs> but you know what happens? They rout the innumerable Midianite army and they send them packing. Why? Because God doesn't do math like you do math. One faithful person can do an incredible thing in God's kingdom. You've seen that already, right? With Achan, one disloyal person affected the entire community. We've seen Paul echo the same thought. One person who's not working hard for the Lord can affect the whole. But we've also seen it with the little boy. One faithful person can do something incredible in God's kingdom. Numbers, he doesn't care about them. 300 men are greater than 30,000 if those 300 are faithful. Right? An individual, a small group, can do incredible things for the Lord if we're faithful. He doesn't do numbers like we do numbers. He's not attracted by crowds. In fact, if you go back through and you read the Gospels, Jesus was always a little standoffish with crowds. He was always a little unsure about what they wanted because often what they wanted was food. Often what they wanted was the miracle, the healing, the selfish reasons. That's why they were coming to Jesus. But when an individual came to him and threw himself down at his feet, Jesus understood this. He could see through that guy's heart. You really trust. You're, you're throwing everything away to have me. One person, one faithful person, can do just about anything they want in God's kingdom because he likes to work through individuals like that. It's difficult to work through a person who doesn't love, who doesn't trust, who's not faithful. But one faithful person, in his eyes, in his kingdom, equals 30,000 unfaithful anywhere else. Look back in Jonathan's story in 1 Samuel 14. The Philistines are uh, much like the Midianites. There's more of them than there are the Israelites. Certainly in this instance, Jonathan and his, soul and his armor bearer, who's not a warrior, this guy carries Jonathan's armor with him. Um, so he's not most likely swinging a sword, most likely not accustomed to shooting a bow and arrow or throwing a spear. He's accustomed to carrying Jonathan's armor. And so Jonathan looks back at his, at his friend and he says, let's attack the Philistine army. See what happens here in 1 Samuel chapter 14. Verse 6, Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over the, to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. That's the concept we've been talking about to this morning. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. He doesn't do math like you do math. Numbers don't matter to him. And so... If you're an individual who is faithful, that's the one God can work through. If you're putting it all on the line for him, if you're passionately following him, that's the one he can work through. He doesn't care anything about numbers. He'd rather have a small crowd that's faithful than a large crowd that's unfaithful. 
can't do anything with a large crowd that's unfaithful. He can do incredible things through a small crowd that is faithful. And so here we stand as Jonathan and his armor bearer go across to fight against the Philistines. And you know what happens. You read the rest of the story this afternoon over lunch. They rout the Philistine army and they send them running. Two men, <coughs> two faithful men do something incredible here because God doesn't do math like you do math. Numbers don't matter to him. He doesn't care. He cares about righteousness. Flip back over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Paul would agree with this thought. In Romans 8, 31, he says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The Midianite army? No, not them. But there's so many of them. doesn't matter. If you're faithful, God can do incredible things through you. And so we've got a VBS coming up, right? What can God do through you to affect his kingdom with some of these songs we sing and some of the classes that we do and the decorations and all this? These things seem small, don't they? God can use small things to affect incredible change if you're faithful. He can do incredible things. If you're faithful. He doesn't do math like we do math. He doesn't need big crowds, big numbers. He needs faithfulness. And so what you, what's your dream? What's your, what's your biggest dream, right? Um, we've got several dreams. Uh, we want to buy a bigger camper and go to different places and trips to Alaska and trips to Israel and all these other trips that we want to go on. And those are very physical dreams, right? But what's your, what's your spiritual dream? You got a dream? I want to memorize some of the books of the Bible. Maybe James. Maybe Acts. No, no, no. I want to memorize some of the books of the Bible. I want to become a better Christian, a better preacher, right? What's your spiritual dream? You need a spiritual dream. You need a vision, a goal for what you're headed toward. But let me leave you with this, with this thought. Ephesians chapter... Three. Ephesians 3, verse 20 and 21. You need a dream, but check out what Paul says here about God and dreams in Ephesians 3, 20. Now, to him who is able to do, check this out, far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So whatever your dream is, it's too small. Because he can do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. You need a big dream for God. Because one person, one faithful person, can make a huge difference in his kingdom. So the question for you this morning is, are you faithful? Are you faithfully following him? Are you devoted to Christ? Have you been buried with him in baptism, having all your sins washed away and becoming a part of his kingdom? If you haven't, that's something you need to make right this morning to be added to his church, to be a part of his family, but also to have your sins washed away. Maybe you've already made that decision this morning and you just need the prayers of this congregation to be devoted to him, to be passionately following him. Whatever you need this morning, won't you come as we stand and sing? I have resolved no longer to linger from my word. The Yeah.
Aloha, church family. <laughs> Hope everybody's doing all right today. Uh, Chris, great lesson, brother. Appreciate you. Uh, a couple announcements um, before we are dismissed. As, as you can see, uh, it's great to have everybody back from Scotland. Uh, Mandy says they had a great trip. I'm glad to have Mandy back. Um, I tell them myself, I burnt pasta. Uh, I, I can't cook. Um, I tried. Um, only leave it to me to burn pasta, but, um, but it's great to have them back, and I uh, know they did wonderful things there in Scotland. Um, but Vacation Bible School is tonight at 6.30, from 6.30 to 8.45. Um, we're still needing some cookies, so if you can bring uh, some cookies for the adult class, I know we'd greatly appreciate that. And I also need two volunteers just for tonight for registration. So if you cannot be here through the rest of the week and you want to help out with Vacation Bible School, I need two volunteers to help out with registration uh, just for tonight. Um, and you'd have to be here uh, 30 minutes early, so that way it gives everybody time to uh, get ready for registration, uh, get everybody in. Um, also, uh, change of schedule uh, for the middle school and high school. Uh, we had scheduled a devotional for Sunday um, after services. Um, our summer is usually about serving others and serving God and helping others. Um, so we are going to, uh, on Saturday, meet here at the building at 630 um, and college kids, if you want to come and help out with this, and I also need some adults uh, to help uh, supervise, but we are going to pass out pizza uh, to the homeless uh, near in Huntington. Um, so if you want to feed the, uh, feed the homeless, the um, only reason I want some adults there, so that way our kids are safe, um, but we're going to meet here at the building at 530 on Saturday. I'd love to have you. Uh, come out and uh, participate in that, and we're going to hand out Bibles as well, and then afterwards go to Rapid Fire Pizza. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's always about serving others and, and, and uh, letting God's light shine within our community. Um, updates on our prayer list. Remember, continue to keep uh, Jennifer and Darren uh, Baker in your prayers as they go through their cancer treatments. Also, remember, continue to keep Sandy Galloway in your prayers as well. She undergoes her cancer treatments and her test. Um, also, uh, uh, keep Peg Pryor in your prayers. She fell. Um, well, she didn't fall. I'm sorry. She hurt her arm again. Uh, she was lifting the lawnmower over and heard something pop in her bad arm, and she cannot use her, 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 her right arm again. Uh, so, remember, continue to keep Peg in your prayers. Uh, as she recovers from her injuries and takes care of Roger. But that's all the announcements I have. Looking forward to seeing everybody again. Um, uh, uh, tonight is 6.30. Uh, the sign says no shirt, uh, no shoes, no problem. So come as you are. Um, so <laughs> Gary, will you come with no shirt, no shoes? No? Okay. <laughs> but uh, look forward to seeing everybody again at 6.30. We'll sing one more song. We dismissed in prayer. Let us please stand again. We'll sing hymn number 438. My hope is built on nothing less. We'll sing the first two verses, and then Brother Darren Baker will have her prayer. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. My hope is built Darkness, there is nothing there. I rest the 
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this day and the opportunity to come here. Lord, we are truly blessed, and we just pray, Lord, that we'll continue to realize that and worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we're thankful for our church leaders, elders, deacons, all those involved in the activities here at the building and those uh, who are teaching us as well as our young people. And we pray for our vacation Bible school that starts tonight. We pray that we all can attend as much as possible, invite our neighbors, invite our friends, and uh, get the word out, Father, the good word of, of you and your son, Jesus. Father, there's been many mentioned here today, and there's more in our hearts that are ill, and whatever their sickness may be, Father, whether it be physical or spiritual or, or mental, Father, we just pray that you'll be with them and those who are caring after them and watching over them, and Father, uh, hopefully return them to a, a good portion of health. Father, we ask these things that it should, would be your will. It is always your will, Father, and help us to be patient and understanding in our prayers that uh, sometimes our prayers happen, but they happen slowly. Sometimes they happen and they're not always the way we want, but they'll be the way that you want things to be. Father, be with us throughout the remainder of this day. And again, uh, help us to return this evening to Bible school. And it's in your son's precious name that we ask all of these things. And amen.